In this video, I'm going to talk to you about reflection and refraction. Here's an overview of what I'll be talking about. So reflection in optics is the process by which light bounces off surfaces. It can be categorized in two main ways, the specular reflection and diffuse reflection. And these are really important phenomena and they help us understand and interpret the world around us as well as help us to design various optical devices. So specular reflection occurs when light hits a smooth surface. This type of reflection is responsible for the formation of clear images. And mirrors are the most common example where we obtain specular reflection. In contrast, diffuse reflection occurs when light hits a rough or irregular surface. The incoming light rays are scattered in many directions and there's no clear image formation when the light is reflected. Now here is an example. So the images below show a building with its reflection in a lake. And on the left hand side, the image shows what the building would look like if the lake reflected it precisely like in a mirror. And on the right hand side, it shows how the building is actually reflected in the lake. Because the lake is not perfectly smooth, we actually get diffuse reflection and it appears funny, fuzzy and diffuse. So focusing on specular reflection now, if we have a flat mirror and then draw a dashed line, that dashed line represents the normal and it's 90 degrees from the flat mirror. We can then draw in an incident ray. So this is a light ray that travels in a straight line and it hits the mirror at the point where the normal line intersects with the mirror as well. That light ray will be reflected and we refer to that as the, reflect, the reflected ray. Now the angle between the normal and the incident ray is referred to as the angle of incidence. And then the angle between the normal and the reflected ray is referred to as the angle of reflection. And what we find is that they are equal to each other. So with specular reflection, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And just to note the symbol that we're using here for the angles is the lowercase Greek letter theta. OK, so let's move to a situation where we don't have a solid object that reflects, but rather uh, in this case, we've got water that the light ray can actually transmit into. So we'll draw our incident ray. Again, we've drawn in the normal line 90 degrees to the surface of the flat water. And we have an angle of incidence again. But this time, because the surface isn't reflecting, the ray actually gets transmitted into the water. And therefore we have a refracted ray that goes through and we have an angle of refraction. So we're using theta subscript I for the angle of incidence and theta subscript T for the refracted ray. So this is referred to as refraction. And what we find is that the angle of incidence doesn't, does not equal the angle of refraction, except for when the theta subscript i equals zero. So if that ray came in along the same line as the normal, then it would continue to go along that line. That's the only case where it, this doesn't apply in terms of the angle of incidence not equaling the angle of refraction. OK, so if we now label these two different medium, uh, medium one, medium two, that the light ray is traveling through, we're now going to change the angles to theta one, theta two. And we've got an equation that we can use to relate the two together. So it's n subscript one sine theta one equals n subscript two sine theta two. Now the n refers to refractive index and theta is the angle either of incidence or refraction. And this is referred to as Snell's law. And as I just mentioned earlier, this the n1, n2 
is the refractive in index of the two medium. OK, so refraction then is the process by which light changes speed and direction when it travels from one medium into another. The refractive index itself of a medium is a measure of how much the speed of light is reduced inside the medium compared to the speed of light in a vacuum. So we're going to have to take a moment and think about what refractive index actually is. So the equation that we have is that refractive index equals speed of light in a vacuum divided by speed of light in the medium. Now, refractive index of a medium depends on several factors. So it depends on the material that the medium is made from, depends on the density of the medium, the temperature and the wavelength of the light. So if we look, just look at these different materials for a moment, we can see that for different materials, the refractive index changes quite considerably. And the wavelength at which all of these were measured is at 589.3 nanometers. It's also referred to as the sodium D line. It's the light color, it's the, it's the like orangey yellow color that sodium lamps emit. OK, so in terms of refractive index and density, we've got some silicon dioxide polymorphs here. So these are all made from SiO2. But what's different is the way that that is arranged. And you can see that the density varies for these different polymorphs. And the refractive index itself also then varies. Another factor is temperature of the medium. So here we have an example acetic acid and we can see that the refractive index on the y-axis changes as the temperature changes on the x-axis. And we can actually look at the gradient of this so we can see how much that the refractive index varies with respect to temperature. And in this case between 20 degrees and 50 degrees for acetic acid at 589.3 nanometers, it varies by minus 0.00042. And we can use this value in the equation shown here. So N subscript D, D refers to the sodium D line, the 589.3 nanometers, and that will equal N subscript D superscript 20. So that is the refractive index of the medium at 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and then we have to plus brackets T minus 20 times by dN by dT. Now that dN by dT is just the constant that we saw earlier on. And it depends on wavelength and it depends on the material that we're interested in. And the T value here is just the temperature in degrees C. So we can use this information to look at how refractive index varies with temperature. Another factor is the wavelength of the light. So here we have an example for a particular type of glass and we can look at how the refractive index varies with wavelength and we can see it's not a straight line but it's curved. And a very simple equation that we can use to fit to this data is the Cauchy equation. So we have n equals a plus b divided by lambda squared. Now a and b are parameters that we have to deduce by fitting the data to measured, measured values. OK, so in this particular case, over this wavelength range for this particular type of glass, we have a value of A that is 1.50458 and a value of B that is 4204.13. So now we're going to move on to look at a circular glass prism and how light interacts with this. Now we're going to mark in the center point and we're going to draw a normal line through this. Now if we draw a tangent at the point where the this center line, this dashed line, exits the circular prism, then what we find is that that is at 90 degrees. 
and that has an important consequence. So that means that this line is normal to the surface of the glass. And because of what we know about Snell's law, if the angle of incidence is zero, so if it's following this normal line, then as the light travels through the glass, the, the angle does not change because it's gone in at, at zero degrees. And it will also exit at uh, zero degrees from the normal. So the light just travels through in a straight line as long as it passes through that center point, because that means that as it enters and exits, the angle of incidence is zero degrees and therefore the angle of refraction is zero degrees. Now we can use this idea with a semicircular glass prism and look at how the light refracts. Okay, so we have the center of the semicircle and this center is where the radius would be drawn from to get the semicircle. We draw a normal line through that point and that's at 90 degrees to the flat edge of the semicircle and then we can draw an angle of incidence for our light ray going in. So we've got the light ray going in, it doesn't bend or refract as it goes into the flat surface but as it now exits it will be refracted and the angle will be different and as we spoke about earlier we can use Snell's law to work out the angle of refraction. It would just require us to rearrange that equation. Now, as we increase the angle of incidence, then so too does the angle of refraction increase. And we can increase this further and further until we get to the point where the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. And this is quite a special point. Um, as we've increased the angle of incidence further and further, once we get to an angle of refraction of 90 degrees, there's some important things that we need to sort of pause uh, uh, and, and sort of talk about at this stage. So because we're now at 90 degrees, the light ray as it exits is traveling along the surface of the semicircular glass prism. And at this stage, it actually becomes very diffuse and, and faint. And that's because most of the light is now reflected back in the prism. And this is referred to as total internal reflection. And we can actually work out uh, what's happening using Snell's law again. So we have to set theta 2 to, to 90 degrees. Now, when medium 2 is air, N2 is approximately 1. So if we put those values in, we get N1 sine theta 1 equals 1 times sine 90. Now, sine 90 is 1. And so overall, we get N1 sine theta 1 equals 1. We can divide both sides by N1. And we're now at the stage where we introduce the terminology critical angle. So this is quite an important angle. The angle of incidence where we get this refracted ray being refracted at 90 degrees is the critical angle. So we'll just change all the subscripts from 1 to C because at this point we're at the critical angle. So theta subscript C is referred to as the critical angle. And this equation that's now highlighted with the red box is quite an important one uh, to, to actually have to be able to calculate various things. So it might be that you're given the critical angle and then you can work out the refractive index of the medium or vice versa. So once we get to the stage where the angle of incidence is equal to or greater than the critical angle, we get this total internal reflection occurring and the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. So that's been a video about reflection and refraction. I hope you found that useful. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe and thanks very much for watching.